I'm a feminist, but when I was at the airport, there was a delightful looking petite white woman who really needed help with her bags. And I thought, no, life has a way of helping lovely ladies like you out. And I was right, because within two seconds, a big hunky man lifted her suitcase with one hand and lifted her personage with the other hand and guided her to her taxi. They're probably a couple now. They are probably a couple. They probably went straight into the taxi and started frolicking and are really, really happy. Are you sure he didn't know her? If he no, he didn't. No, he really didn't. He went, uh, do you need help with that? She was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah, the thing is, those suitcases are... But then he picked her up. No, he didn't. That was for comedy. He did pick... <laughs> okay. I if thought, he picked I her up, I would have went thought, right I over you, there. I think you witnessed, him out. witnessed an abduction. Yes. <laughs> and thought it was romance. This is what romantic comedies have done to us. We can witness an abduction and we think go, it's romance. As long as he's got a boombox, he can take anyone he likes. <laughs> I'm going to do my I'm a Feminist Butts on behalf of the women I read about in Rick Stroud's Lonely Courage, the SOE executives of the Second World War. These are all true that I took from the book. I'm a feminist, but when they changed my identity so I could go and spy on behalf of the Allies against the Nazis, as they were changing my name, I asked them to knock eight years off my age as well. <laughs> because why not? <laughs> because if you're going to die, die young. <laughs> I would totally do that. So I do would that. do that. <laughs> Come the glorious revolution. Yeah. I will die at 26. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of age, I'm a feminist, but when people tell me black women age gracefully, I say, too right, we deserve something, black privilege. <laughs> it's true. We, I was recently in America <laughs> with... Susie and I said, oh, I don't really like getting my thighs out because I've got cellulite. And she said, so have I. And I said, you can't see it, though. White skin, you can really see it. And she went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and so I said, check your privilege. <laughs> and she said, just trying to be an ally, mate. <laughs> oh, God, I did say that. I'm so funny. <laughs> Susie. Susie's going into a play in the West End and it's breaking my heart because she can't do any more I'm a Feminist Butts for six months or something ridiculous. Again, this is another one from an SOE. I'm a feminist, but although I'm South Asian, to hide my identity while in France, I dyed my hair blonde and wore huge sunglasses because I thought it made me look glamorous. <laughs> I mean, that is not hiding your identity. That is drawing attention. That is really standing out. I'm a feminist, but when my mate told me that she's pregnant with a little girl, my immediate thought was, oh, no. <laughs> I will explain. <laughs> Being born a cis woman, I know how hard it is. And I thought, oh, no, she's going to have to go through everything that we've gone through and we've got to make the world a better place. But we can't take away the fact that my first thought was, oh, no. <laughs> this is another one. From Behind Enemy Lines. This is from a woman called Matilda Carre. I'm a feminist, but I loved that my code name was La Chat, or The Cat. And I ended up having both French and German lovers became a double agent and got done for treason. <laughs> we'll have Rick Stroud on. He'll probably tell me everything I've said was misunderstood, <laughs> incorrect, and I got the names wrong. Live from King's Place in London, the spontaneity of the guilty feminist, Deborah Francis White, and guest star host, Susan Burma, and very special guest, Rick Stroud, talking about intrepid women. Please welcome back to the stage the London International Gospel Choir. My tongue and hold my breath, get to rock the boat and make a mess. So I said quietly, agreed politely. I guess that I forgot I had a choice. I let you push me past the breaking point. I stood for nothing, so I fell for anything. You held me down, but I got up. Hey, already brushing off the dust. You hear my voice, you hear that sound. Like thunder gonna 
shake the ground Help me down, but I got up Already cause I've had enough I see a roll, I see it now I've got the eye of the tiger Fire, dancing through the fire Cause I am a champion And you're gonna hear me roar Louder, louder than a lion Cause I am a champion And you're gonna Shake the ground, help me down, but I gotta get hey, ready cause I had enough. I see it all, I see it now. I got the eye of the tiger, fighter, dancing through the fire. Cause I am a champion, and you're gonna hear me roar louder, louder than a lion. Cause I am a champion, and you're gonna. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. So, Susan McComa. Hiya. Hello. Have you had a guilty week or a feminist week? I've had both of those things. I've had a... I mean, yes, it's been tremendously guilty and full of all the feminism. Can you tell us any of the guilt? I know what the feminism is and I know that's mm. coming up. You've got such a good show ahead of you and I'm just getting really excited. And look at how I'm dressed as well. Like, I know. There's a lot going on. And you all... Have... We've gone a bit so World amazing. War II because that's very much the theme of our show, oh, of so our episode. We're so excited for what we've yes. done this week. We should do prizes for costumes. Yes. Karen's gone now, but she wanted to give the first prize tickets to the breadwinners. <laughs> so, so we can't really just give you two tickets because there's loads of breadwinners. So all of the breadwinners get the free ticket to a show coming up of their choosing. Um, are you still here, the breadwinners? Yeah, there you are, there you are. We also wanted to give T-shirts to our ninja, um, uh, to our Cleopatra, and to our Don't Call Me Girl Girl. Really, I want to give a T-shirt and tickets to absolutely everybody, but that was the amount we had. So uh, that's the direction we've gone in. But we loved everybody's, and I kind of hate competitions because they make me feel like some people are better than others, and that's not the central tenet of feminism. But some people are better than others. No, Susie. <laughs> some are. There's a few that you look at and you're like, you're better than everybody else. That's, that's me. Nice. That's <laughs> sure. It's true. Sure. Uh, today, uh, we're discussing Rick Stroud's Lonely Courage, which is a book about the special operations executive, the women who were dropped behind enemy lines, just living ordinary lives, whatever their version yeah. of ordinary lives were, and they just agreed to go to France and just to agreed, spy. Nothing else on. They had to kill people at times, they had to get messages back, some they free had to time. receive people, <laughs> they had to do seducing to get information, all sorts, all sorts. Yeah, um, mate. Yeah, and, uh, and we were so inspired, and we feel like times are, times are feeling intrepid again. Yeah, and we wanted to draw, and also we just wanted to not forget these women, yeah, and we absolutely. wanted to draw on their intrepid spirits. That's what we're talking about, and that's why we're both dressed eccentrically. <laughs> uh, like sort of the suggestion of special operation executive women. Don't laugh. Why are you laughing? We look great, mate. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, we want to talk a little bit about this book now it looks like it's been through a battlefield but that's because I was on a plane and I put my chair forward and I didn't realise it crushed the book for the whole journey 
So I'm going to read you some little bits out of it now. So first of all, there were women in here that I really felt I related to. So one was Virginia Hall, an American, who was basically trying to have a career in the Foreign Service and had been frustrated before the war. One of her superiors had described her as a satisfactory clerk, but a woman of unbounded ambition with no self-awareness who talked too much. I thought, that's me. And I got the sense, a little bit like when we talked about the suffragettes, that Mm. for a lot of these women, you'd think, why the hell would they agree to do this? But life was boring for women. They couldn't do anything. They kept being stopped. And so it was an exciting opportunity, in a way, to just burst out and be able to do things. For example, there's someone here called Nancy Wake, and she says there really was a sense that Europe was going straight to hell and that there was only a limited time to enjoy what you wanted to do. Everyone was packing as much pleasure into every day as we could. No one knew what tomorrow would bring. It might seem frivolous to do what we were doing, but we thought that it was not only probable that this was our last summer before the war, it might just be our last summer full stop. And I feel like, again, with Trump, there's some of that right now, where we're feeling like this is an exciting time. Drink champagne as fast as you can while campaigning. Um, (laughs) Champagne campaign. Yeah. Yeah. There was another woman here described as pretty smart and pig-headed. There's lots of women where you feel there's this sense of them that they're being held back all the time and that this opportunity to join the SOE allows this pig-headedness, this stubbornness, this big, you know, don't put me in a box to come out. Matilda Carey told her companion, there's almost a sensual pleasure in real danger, don't you think? Your whole body seems to suddenly come alive. Mm. There's some really excitement there. (laughs) Um, mm. <laughs> I'd ask you to read that again. No, I will after the show. After Thank the show, you. we'll just sit out the back. Um, <laughs> I loved here that there was, um, and this feels very contemporary as well. There was a leaflet that went round in Paris: thirty-three hints for the occupied. It was a BuzzFeed list of its day. <laughs> um, one of the hints was: on the outside, pretend you don't care; on the inside, stoke your anger. Mm. It will serve you well. And one of them says, you won't find copies of these tips at your local bookshop. Make copies for your friends who will make copies too. This will be a good occupation for the occupied. Um, And again, now I feel like we're getting into that activism. Mm. There was a lot of romance in it as well. So here there's someone called Violet Wachel. She was in France and she had instructions from her mother to find a homesick French soldier and bring him to their house in South London. That night, this soldier sat with the Bushels in Stockwell eating supper and talking in French. And before he went back to his barracks in Farnborough, he asked Violet if they could perhaps meet again. The next month, they were married. I just think that she was 19 and he was 30. All sorts of things like that. One of the here, Christina, had many admirers. One rejected suitor threatened to castrate himself with a revolver, but failed hitting himself in the foot. (laughs) Um, Christina, the same woman, was the bravest woman he had ever met, adding, she could do anything with dynamite except eat it. I mean, it was sort of an exciting time, wasn't it? I loved also that the book demonstrates how intersectional the war was. There were clear implications that some of these women were gay. For example, mm. um, Le Chien gave her some tips of the way of the world and summed her up as cool and calm and brave, a good comrade for men, but nothing more, you understand? <laughs> which I love. There was a woman called Adele Le Chien. She had an artificial leg that she called Cuthbert. Um, and... At one point, she signalled London, telling them that Cuthbert was being troublesome. London replied that she should execute him. (laughs) And then there was Noor Iniak Khan, who was an Asian woman who kept changing her hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blonde, redhead, anything that drew more attention to her. I mean, she was absolutely extraordinary, non-spy. She kept telling everyone, she kept saying, I'm a spy, you know. Yeah, yeah, guys, I'm a spy. But it was also incredibly brilliant in other ways. So we thought we'd get to this point and we'd read about, I suppose, the inspiration for our challenge. This part of the book starts, at the end of her training, Burrell was commissioned as an ensign in the first aid nursing yeomanry, otherwise known as the Fannies. (laughs) First aid nursing yeomanry. (laughs) A quasi-military operation and the only women who were allowed to bear arms. It was hoped that, because they were fannies, the female female agents, if captured, would be treated as soldiers and not spies. Before being sent into the field, Burrell reported to the parachute training centre at Ringway near Manchester, where she did the required five jumps and owned her parachute wings. She was ready to be sent into action. All she could do was await her orders. And then we come to the jump. 
Barrel was parachuted into France on the 24th of September. She was accompanied by Lise de Bézac, whose brother Claude was already an SOE agent. De Bézac's orders were to establish her own small network. Her commandment had described her as quite imperturbable and would remain cool in any situation. She was very much ahead of her fellow students. The two women flew to France in a Whitley bomber. Circling over the drop zone, the pilot saw the indication lights had been set too near the trees that hedged the field, and the lights themselves were wrong. He aborted the mission. The next night, the mission was repeated. Before takeoff, Borel and de Bezac drew straws to see who should jump first. Borel won. The atmosphere in the plane on the second attempt was tense. This time, the pilot saw that the lights were white instead of red. A torch flashed the correct recognition signal, and he decided to go ahead with the jump. The dispatcher opened the hatch. Burrell sat with her legs dangling into space. The green light flashed, and she jumped into the slipstream of the plane. Her chute opened with a thump, and she floated down, followed by de Bezac. Both women landed as trained, rolled on their sides, collapsed their parachutes, and punched the quick-release buttons on their chests. Andre and Lise were the first women to be parachuted into France. So this is how this went down now for me and Susie Wacoma. <laughs> because we decided to take this on as our challenge. <laughs> now we've written this account tonight instead of stand-up comedy as a World War II diary entry. And here, here it goes. Susan, I said, do you want to jump out of an aeroplane with me for a challenge for the Guilty Feminist podcast to see if we can be intrepid women like the ones in World War II? Do you, do you? <laughs> Goody gosh, I said. <laughs> I suppose we sort of have to now. You've gone and suggested it like that, don't we? Rather, I replied. I made the appointment at the London School of Parachuting, which was in Reading. Actually. <laughs> actually, it wasn't in Reading in the end. It was at the Chilton Park Aerodrome after all that. I suppose that's to confuse the enemy. I suppose so. <laughs> we met at Paddington Station. It was Saturday, so the station was heaving. Children everywhere. The noise was deafening. The smell unbearable. A hundred squashed into a carriage meant for 45. Shall we do the weekend upgrade? It'll only be a fiver to Reading to go first class on a Saturday, I said. Rather, I said. <laughs> we sat on the train with a cup of tea and a biscuit and a stout resolution not to turn back on any account, no matter how terrifying it was. What if we die, though? That would be an awful bore, I said. <laughs> it would rather ruin the weekend, I said. But we'll be more likely to die in the car from the station to the aerodrome, I said. <laughs> Statistically speaking and all that. Of course we are, I said. I'm being rather silly. It's just, uh, I mean... I know, I said. <laughs> I don't even like going on the flume ride at all to the towers. <laughs> I don't mind going upside down, but anything with a straight down component rather terrifies me, you see. We could get off the train before Reading. The thing is, it's an express train. There are no stops whatsoever between here and Reading. It goes Paddington, Reading, Tax Cab, Chilton, Aerodrome, Aeroplane, Ground. Well, that's a rotten piece of luck. Rather, I said. <laughs> but come the glorious feminist revolution, we'll need leaders. And if we can face this, we'll be the kind of leaders that feminism needs. So people will say, why should we listen to you? And we'll say... Because we jumped out of an aeroplane strapped to an army chap who did all the real jumping. Perhaps we should leave the part about the army chap out while we tell them. <laughs> Rather... When we arrived in Reading, we telephoned Martin at the London Parachute School, which was really in Reading, which was really in Cheltenham. Gosh, he said, the weather's filthy. We've already had to abort two missions today. Sorry, girls, but we might not get round to you today. Oh, no, our mission will be aborted. Just like our SOE sisters was first time around. Martin told us to go and have lunch. We had burger and chips. I was pretending to be disappointed, but secretly I was relieved that we wouldn't be jumping out of the aeroplane to our almost certain death. We had burgers and chips. I was pretending to be disappointed, but was secretly relieved that we wouldn't be jumping out of an aeroplane to my almost certain death. We laughed so gaily throughout lunch, we almost forgot about the whole parachuting lark. And then, 
The telephone rang. Ring, 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 ring. I suppose you'd better answer it. Gosh, I said. I swear I saw Grim Reaper come up on my telephone as I picked it up. <laughs> it was Martin. Get here as soon as possible, he said. The sun has got his hat on. <laughs> hip, 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 hooray. <laughs> oh, fuck, I thought. We took a hackney carriage to the aerodrome, and when we got there, we got suited and booted. I'm a feminist, but when they weighed us for good measure, I thought, surely this whole thing is grim enough without standing on scales in a public place. <laughs> but apparently it was something that needed to be done for health and safety and all that malarkey. As they strapped us into the harness, the lady said, Oh, I saw your trainer taking his medication this morning, but I warn you, his cat just died. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I'm fairly sure she was joking, but serious now, goodness gracious, and what the fuck? We stood in the field and waited for the pilot and decided to draw straws, just like in the book. I got the short one, which meant I jumped first. I suppose it was only fair, because I'd got us into all of this in a way, really. I rigged it. I knew it. We got into the plane and the instructor pulled us close. Terribly close. Sexually close in a way. I mean, we were in their laps. 7,000 feet. 8,000 feet. 9,000 feet. 10,000 feet. My instructor, Ryan, all army, mostly tattoos, <laughs> rolled us down the plane as the door opened. <laughs> I sat with my legs out, just like they had showed me dangling over the side of the plane, banana shape. My body in the shape of a banana, if you see what I mean. That's what they told me, stick out your chest and the legs go under the plane, you see. We were high up in the clouds. Surely, we're not really going to. And we were out! I was meant to look at the cameraman, but I forgot. Suddenly, I was turning, twisting in the air, trying to get my feet back, like they'd said, trying to get my head back, trying to get it all back, like a banana, you see, but, but my legs were like a puppet's in the wind. Ryan pulled my head to his chest as the wind flipped us over and over and over again. I knew it had gone wrong. Our cameraman was miles away. We were flipped upside down like a pancake in the clouds. I couldn't see. The air was roaring. Oh, fuck, I thought. <laughs> well, I've had a wonderful life. <laughs> Susie, I leave you the podcast, I tried to shout, but I couldn't be heard. <laughs> the roar of the free fall was the only sound I'd ever hear again. Suddenly, the parachute opened with a jolt. We were saved. There we were, just like that, floating over the beautiful countryside. Hurrah! Sorry about that, Ryan shouted, caught in a current. That was faster than normal. <laughs> we weren't meant to flip upside down, were we? I shouted back. Happens sometimes, Ryan said. Happens sometimes, happens sometimes. <laughs> much faster than normal. Don't really know what happened. Faster than normal. Much faster than normal. It was really <laughs> much, much faster than normal. It was sort of superhuman speeds. Yeah, it was much faster than normal. I don't know what happened. We left the photographer behind. He couldn't keep up, he said. Want to do some spins? Not really, I thought. Sure, I said. <laughs> I didn't want to be a girl about it. We twirled around, around, and I felt horribly sick. Then we turned around, around the other way. It didn't turn the sickness back. <laughs> I got to the door of the plane. It was a long way down. We were sitting in a cloud. I screamed, and then I remembered the cameraman, looked to my left, and did my best camera face. <laughs> I'm an actress first and a jumper second. <laughs> if you're going to die, you want the last photographs taken of you to be smashers for the news at 10. I felt a jolt from behind and I sprang into freefall. Terrifying, but the cameraman was with us, so I did my best face and my big thumbs up. Instagram heaven. <laughs> Susie Woozy 12, if you'd like to have a look. <laughs> when the parachute opened, my chap asked me if I wanted to do some spins. No, thanks, I said. I always got nauseous as a child on a roundabout. I didn't want to vomit in the air. The cameraman is right there, and I always hit my mark. <laughs> Five minutes later, I landed on the ground, pulling my legs up as I'd been trained to do. Five minutes later, I landed on the ground, pulling my legs up as I'd been trained to do. We, we hugged. <laughs> We'd made it. We were alive. We were intrepid women. We'd done it for the fannies. <laughs> we called a taxi cab. We were so grateful to reach civilization. The minute I saw a Pret-a-Manger, I knew we were safe. 
We had enough French to know that meant takeaway food. Although I couldn't eat a thing. I headed straight for the Carsey where I threw up three times at Reading Station. Genuinely happened. <laughs> and I headed off to a campsite, just like a real fanny. Except it was more of a theatre campsite run by Philida Lloyd, wasn't it? So you could read poetry and things like that, wasn't it? No actual Nazis, wasn't it? Well, yeah, well, yes, yes, well, no Nazis, but you went home to an actual bed with even fewer chances of Nazis, didn't you? I had a hot bath and a lemonade popsicle and I slept for 11 hours. <laughs> The next day I did Pilates and had a massage because my neck was sore. Basically, I would have struggled in a war zone after the free fall. I think that's clear. Still, the fannies would have been proud. Terribly proud. Rather. <laughs> would you like to see it? If you want to see Susie and me jump out of a plane, the video is now on the Guilty Feminist YouTube channel. That was our big jump. I'm so excited from that, from watching that. When I watched it again, I actually can't believe that we did it. I can't believe we did it. I'm pretty sure a little bit. I think I peed on the man. I think I... <laughs> I think I peed on Gary a little bit. You didn't, I just realised you didn't take your goggles off to the end. My guy said I could take my goggles off as soon as we were at a free fall. No, I kept those bad boys on. I kept imagining like a pigeon just to kind of smack. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want that on top of like the No, I, well, mine were up to I just wanted to say. I felt so safe. Once the parachute was out, I felt completely safe. I felt it was just like floating. It was amazing. The free fall bit. That was horrible. It's, it's quite... T- I didn't think it was horrible. It was more... I wasn't... People were saying, oh, were you scared during that? And it's more of a visceral fear that you can't imagine anything as abstract as your death. You can't be planning your funeral. It's just completely happening to you. It's like being dumped by the waves, except imagine the waves of the clouds and imagine there's only death below you. (laughs) Our guest tonight is a writer and television director with an Emmy win and a BAFTA nomination to his name. His new book, Lonely Courage, tells the true story of the women who fought to free Nazi-occupied France. Please welcome Rick Stroud! Women were absolutely extraordinary. There was a little bit here that I thought really summed up some of their attitudes. Eventually, Nancy tracked down an agent who could help her across the mountains. She went to the address she had been given, knocked on the door, which opened to reveal a suspicious man. Nancy did not know the passwords, but said, I am Nancy Fiocca. You are in charge of our guides. I work for O'Leary. So do you. I want to go to Spain. I've had enough trouble getting here, so don't give me any crap. (laughs) And he did. And he let her in. And I'm like, these women were just kick-ass. They were like badass. What do you think made them go from leading, you know, whatever their lives were, ordinary for them, into this extraordinary situation that gave them the courage? Well, she was a particularly special one because she already was very, very tough. And a mark of her toughness was that when she was in France, they found a spy in their midst a woman, and they tried her. And these were very tough, sort of 25-year-old French Macisard blokes, and they condemned her to death. And then none of them would execute her. And so Nancy said, if you're not going to do it, I'll do it, and took the gun, and she was all set to shoot this woman. She said, there's no place in this outfit for spies. I'll do it. And they, the French guys were so sort of shocked and ashamed by this that they took over the execution. But the bigger thing is that these were all... I don't like her as much now. No, No, you do. You you, you like her a lot. No, you you do like her. You do like her. Because she was shooting somebody who had betrayed them, who'd caused endless misery. Even so, my 21st century sensibilities... No! No, 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 You do. You you like her. I'm sure you like her. I like her. See, I was listening to all of that, and I was like, yeah! Yeah. She sounds dope. But But the bigger point is that they were, on the whole, ordinary women who, when the chips were down, and the chips went down very, very fast and hard once Mm. they were in France, who then produced extraordinary levels of uh, bravery. They really (laughs) did. How much do you think it was that being a woman was quite dull, and a lot of them were women with great capacity for big careers, and to be physically brilliant and mentally brilliant and have these exciting adventures that they just couldn't have in peacetime because no one was offering? Well, I mean, one of the women that you've mentioned, who is called Virginia Hall who had the wooden leg, she had tried for years to get on in the American diplomatic corps, 
And she was told, no, no, no. She, she, she talked put, too much. She talked too much. She's Un- put unbridled down. Unbridled ambition. Unbridled and ambition. And that was clearly not a compliment. It was not a compliment at all. And eventually they said, oh, well, seeing as you've got a false leg, that automatically debars you from everything. And so she was incredibly frustrated at not being allowed to do what she wanted to do. So the Germans were invading France. She went and drove an ambulance for a bit. And then she got to England and forced the SOE to take her on. And she was inserted in France as an American. She could move around. And suddenly the woman who'd been constrained by bureaucracy, by men putting her down all the time, suddenly completely flowered. And somebody who met her said, if you go into Virginia's kitchen, and remember her kitchen is in Lyon, in the free zone, in France. He said, if you go into Virginia's kitchen, you will meet every important agent in France. And she helps them all. She gives them clothing coupons, food coupons. She gets them out of trouble. She, for nearly two years, was the most important agent in that country. And yet, had the war not happened, she would have probably ended up frustrated and bitter. She wasn't allowed to parachute because she had an artificial leg. She had an artificial leg. From your experience, you'll know that... uh, yeah, you it's need, not yeah. a good thing. From our experience, yeah, yeah. we've got experience. a lot of parachuting experience <laughs> all now. That. All that experience. <laughs> experience. Yeah, I mean, res- with a wooden leg training <laughs> would be trickier. But listen, there are incredible para-athletes yeah. who would parachute better than Susie or Definitely I ever could. Us. But she still managed to... She just oh, basically I mean, didn't... It didn't, it didn't get her done. And eventually, that somebody... Uh, there was a sort of million-franc uh, prize on her head. The Germans came into Lyon... She got the last train out, and the head of the Gestapo said, I would do anything to get my hands on that American bitch. And she then walked across the mountains with the wooden leg. She walked across the Pyrenees. Can you imagine how painful that was? Because, you know, Mm -hmm. the the reality is the stump was rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. She made it, and not only that, she helped two or three other women to make it as well. Do you know, speaking of making it, when Susie and I did this and we had our first aborted mission and then we were drawing straws, we were basically following this story and we were going how weird it is that we're following the story. So I drew the short straw. So I became Andre Borel and Susie became Lisa Pazak. But I didn't know, because I hadn't read the full book then. Mm -hmm. When I came home, I looked up what happened to us. Oh, no. So Burrell oh, died... No, Bur- well, Burrell died in the worst possible circumstances, but Lise de Bezac lived till 2004 and married a fucking interior designer. <laughs> so Ooh. I was not happy. I was not happy. Oh, she, lived, she, she, died, she only died 10 years ago. She That's lived incredible. At, but she died, like, in comfort in an interior designed house. Yeah, she, was, she died in a really nicely She died in a pad. fucking chic pad <laughs> of old age. My character died, I don't even want to say, because I don't want to kill the gig. Yeah. That's how badly she died. God. And I was like, what? I should have read the end of the book before I drew the straws. I didn't know this. It was very upsetting when I read it. Very um, upsetting. Yeah. And Noor Khan. Tell us about Noor Khan, because oh, she was an incredible yeah. Well, Noor Khan was a daughter of a Sufi mystic. All she wanted to do was write children's stories. Her father used to sing her awake in the morning. She was the gentlest oh. creature mm. going. She was an Indian um, princess. She wasn't really sort of equipped to be an agent, and her father had told her she must never tell lies, which meant that if she was caught, she'd tell the truth. (laughs) One of her trainers said, if she's an agent, I'm Winston Churchill. (laughs) But but they sent her in, and for a while, she was the only radio operator in Paris. Mm. They all knew that she was there because she'd been received by a man on the ground who, the SOE run by Clots in London, didn't realise that one of their key people in France was working for the Gestapo. The Gestapo knew who she was, and they followed her and followed her, and that's why she ran out of disguises, which is why she put on dark glasses and dyed her hair. Mm. But it drew masses of attention to her because she was an Asian woman walking around with blonde hair and sunglasses. Yeah, that's right. She looked extraordinary, but she just wasn't really... She wasn't really sort of equipped to deal with it, but she was incredibly brave. Yeah, yeah. And... Noah Khan eventually was... This is a terrible story. Noah Khan eventually was... But it's an uplifting story. Um, (laughs) Noah Khan was eventually arrested. She was interrogated. She tried to escape a few times. And then she was sent to a prison where she was declared to be what's called night and fog, which meant that she should totally disappear. She was kept chained hand and foot in solitary confinement 24 hours a day. She was regularly beaten... Other prisoners could hear her. Nobody knew where she was. They could just hear the shouts and the screams. And at the end of the war, three of the people that she was with were taken out and shot. And she was taken specially into a cell by an SS officer called Rupert. And he was told, give the Creole the works. 
Is this going to get uplifting soon? It's going to get very no, upsetting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is going to upset. No, no, it's going to get up. It's going to get up. It's a bit more upsetting, but it does. You've got to I, hear I this. I still haven't quite finished the book, and I know oh, this isn't no, the end no, of the book. No, no, you've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. So uh, he, he was de debriefed after the war and executed, but he said by the time I'd finished with her, she was a bloody mess. Ow! And then he shot her in the head, and before she died, she said "liberté." And she must have thought that that word that she'd uttered would never, ever be heard by anybody. But 70 years later at Soez, I attended and took part in the Noor Khan Liberté inaugural lecture given by an Indian civil rights lawyer, a wonderful woman called uh, Vinda Grover. So Noor Khan, in her desperate death, set us a, a very, very high standard to live up to. Do you agree with that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very that, much so. that, that is uplifting. <laughs> And I love what you said, Rick, that she would have thought no one would have ever known that she'd said that, mm. but it was reported, it's got back to us, and here we are sitting today hearing exactly. about it. And the other point about this, to be, I mean, really serious, is that we think, oh, it's just little me, whatever I do, it won't make any difference, the forces of darkness are so enormous, but Noah proved that everything we do as individuals is important and adds to our democracy and helps bolster our democracy, and that's one of the lessons that she mm. left for us. And actually, everything mm. they did... Because without the SOE, we wouldn't have won the war. And everything they did means that we sit here today free, able to do a podcast. Yeah, make, having women jokes, yeah. talking, making jokes, being creative. Jump out of planes. Jumping, Jumping out of planes. planes. <laughs> that all of the things that we've got the freedom and the opportunity to do are because each of these individual women who probably thought on their own, well, what impact can I have, did have an impact on all of our lives it and continue to. Impact. Which is why we need to keep their names alive, which is why it's great that you've written this book, Rick. And, I mean, just on the lighter side, you were talking about um, changing your age, if you're going to change your <laughs> name. Well, that Christine Granville, who was another of these um, SOE women, that's exactly what she did. She knocked five years off her age. They yes, gave her a right. new passport. And, <laughs> yeah. and she was that's... very beautiful, and she could drive men bonkers. And she did something which was incredibly brave. She, her um, boss was arrested by the Gestapo with two others. She went into the Gestapo prison and negotiate into a Gestapo prison. She said, I'm an SOE agent, and I'm related to General Montgomery and anybody else you can think of. If you don't release those men, you will end up being thrown to the wolves. And the SS man who was listening to her, the war is about to end, the Americans are 100 miles away, his hands began to shake after three hours in front of her, so badly he couldn't even pour out a cup of coffee. And he released the people, the <gasps> men. And after that, somebody said, this was one of the single most bravest acts by an individual in the whole war. Three cheers for Christine Granville. Right. Has anyone in the audience got a question? There's one there. Thank you. So I'm a mathematician and I missed my moment earlier. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but for me, a lot of this story feels like the story of networks, the story of feminist support networks. And I wanted to ask... Deborah and Susie, what your experience has been of feminist support networks and whether you feel that they've been really, really important for you? Yes, I see what you mean. I mean, interestingly, the book is called Lonely Courage because a lot of them were told don't talk to anybody because the more people that you know... No, that's not true. It's <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why you're here, Rick. That's why we've invited you to correct things like this. Oh, it's the, it's no. the um, quote, isn't it? No, what happened was that the SOE was originally all men. It was very sort of patrician, paternalistic, patronising. And when the man who was sort of recruiting people said, well, I think women would be better at this. And they went, oh, no, 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 don't be silly. I mean, women, maybe they can be at home and do the knitting and that's all right. But this guy went to the Prime Minister and said, I think women have a cool and lonely courage which would make them better. I want to recruit women. What do you think, Prime Minister? And the Prime Minister looked at him and said, yes, good luck. And from that moment on, they were recruiting women because women are then in a very lonely world and they're better at doing it than blokes. Do you think they were more experienced at being without I think the support got... network because they were already sort of isolated by the patriarchy? I think they've got better sort of emotional resources. And they, over and over, I mean, one woman called Pearl Witherington was told, my dear, you have no leadership qualities whatsoever, but we're sending you out to run a safe house. A year later, she was commanding 4,000 French Macizard. She was 25, and they were all you know, young blokes who would do exactly as they saw fit. And she had them completely under her thumb. She had leadership qualities way above mm. any of the blokes had. In this There's so. also something very interesting about sex workers in the book as well, that often brothels were used as places 
where people could be hidden or information could be mm. shared. One of the jobs of the SOE was to gather intelligence. That doesn't mean the big stuff. It means noticing that there's a lorry there with a certain sign on it, and if you tell that all these bits of information add up. Virginia Hall found it very difficult to start her network going, and a man gave her some contacts, people who work in the railway, etc., etc., and one of the most important was the madam of a brothel. Now, in the brothel, they could hide people, but as importantly, when the women were sleeping with the German officers, the lonely, homesick officer would think, ah, oh, Fifi, you're so beautiful, and would tell them things about, you know, I am going tomorrow to Paris, and all these tiny bits of information would then be fed back to the sort of SOE headquarters and would add up to a bigger picture. So the German officers and soldiers, whoever they were, were unwittingly telling these women, thinking it's just pillow talk, Actually, it was an organised intelligence gathering thing. How much did the other women at the SOE seduce men to get information? Or was that just an ad hoc situation if they felt that they could? They didn't sort of set out to do it deliberately. They were told the rule of the SOE, apart from Noah Khan, is be invisible, don't draw attention to yourself, don't get involved. I mean, there was the only, this is not a woman, this is a gay guy who, on his way to, after he'd been put into Paris, had an affair with a German officer on his way back down to the south of France. So he did use sex, but... Um, so, and, but did he, and he managed to get information? No, he fell in love. He fell in love. Oh, God show. damn it. This is oh, what man. happens, isn't it? This is what happens. I mean, Aww. this is why you don't send in the men. <laughs> send in the women. <laughs> we kiss, we tell, we get out. Oh, do you want to read your poem? Yes. This poem was given as a code to Violette Zabo, the French woman who um, bought the soldier home. For me, this sums up what those women sacrificed. The life that I have is all that I have, and the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. A sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have, yet death will be but a pause. For the peace of my years in the long green grass will be yours and yours and yours. And that was Violet Zabo. And she was hanged in Dachau. Thank you so much, Rick, for remembering these women, doing all the research that you've done to bring them to life. There's books, you can buy them in the foyer and Rick will sign them for you if you'd like to buy one here tonight. Or if you're listening at home, Go to a bookshop, get Lonely Courage, or order it on the internet, Rick Stroud, Lonely Courage. It's a beautiful book, and it's keeping the memory of these women alive, and there's an essence of them that I think we need now. Oh, person with charity. What's your charity? It's Home Start Camden. Home Start Camden. Yeah, we are a local charity of a national organisation. We support families with a child on the age of five who are struggling by training up uh, volunteers with parenting experience. Home Start is a national charity that supports local families with children under five who are experiencing difficulties. Yeah. Where do we give to Home Start? Uh, homestartcamden.org. Homestartcamden.org.uk. If you could please donate. It's a wonderful charity and a very feminist one because it's affecting lots of families with women and children. I'm going to quickly say, follow us on Twitter at GuiltFemPod and go to iTunes and give us five stars. Please come on, London International Gospel Choir! <laughs>
seen how you did me wrong, and I'd be strong. And now I know how to get along. I saw your back from out of space. I just wanted to find you here with that sad look upon your face. I should have changed, I should have lied, I should have made you leave your feet. But I know the word for a second. landed as trains, rolled on their sides, collapsed their parachutes and punched the quick release buttons on their chests. Men ran out of the darkness to help bury the parachutes and jumpsuits. In the bright moonlight, they were led off the tiny field and taken across country to a primitive shed where they spent the night. In the morning, a horse and cart took them to a safe house. Andre and Lise were the first women to be parachuted into France. And so... Mm-hmm. Yep, okay. Would have been good to do that later, though, because I was building something. <laughs> Men, I'll tell you. <laughs> this, is, this is what would have scuppered me in the Second World War. <laughs> Just about to step in. I'm doing, oh, I'm doing a bit. I'm doing a bit. Oh, I'm pretending to be, have a different identity. I'm eight years younger. I've got sunglasses on. Could you just take that again? No, I'm a spy. 